Welcome to episode 93 of Delika, a podcast between two friends about the latest in society, politics, and feminism, in Indonesia and the world. I'm Stephanie Tankiewicz. And I'm Sweden Lee. And this week we have a very special guest, Amir Jones, who is half Indonesian and half African American, and also a very active political campaigner in America. Uh, we're going to talk to Amir about the Black Lives Matter movement and sort of like the situation that's happening in the States right now and unpacking all of the questions about structural racism, internal racism, and all of that history and tension that has brought us to this point right now. We're also going to talk about microaggressions and racism within the Indonesian community, as well as what we can do as allies to support this movement. So here's to it. of our listeners i'm sure you have been keeping up with the news about black lives matter especially the recent murders of george floyd brianna taylor ahmed arbery and a whole host of others this conversation goes right into the heart of the matter right about the structural racism and the internal racisms that fuel the conversations right now and we dive right into it so if if listeners you feel like you need to have a refresher or be up to date about what brought us to this place in the first place uh, this is not exactly the right conversation to start with, but if you want to follow up and learn more about what you can do, this is definitely the conversation for you. The essential TLDR is that the latest killings of African American men and women have caused protest, and rightfully so. So this is a topic of understanding where it's coming from historically, as well as um, you know, what are kind of the things that black people face in American society and in the world today, which is like microaggressions, as well as what we as allies can do to support the movement and support um, black men and women. Mm-hmm. As, as listeners, you'll know that this episode is a week later than our usual plan. We really wanted to uh, make sure we talked about the right kind of things with the right kind of people. And so it's really exciting for us, at least, to have Amir on this episode and to have a really eye-opening and insightful and thought-provoking conversation about racism, not just in America, but in other communities as well. Mm-hmm. This is actually going to be the first part of a two-part episode. Um, we had such a great conversation with Amir that we thought there's no possible way we can try to cram everything we've talked about into one episode. So so we decided to split it into two, and we hope that you'll join us in part two of our conversation next week. Right. So here's to it. Today we have a very special guest, Amir Jones. And you know we really want to thank Amir for coming and talk to us. And yeah, Amir, can you tell us a little bit to our listeners about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, my name is Amir Jones. I was born and raised in the D.C. area, um, specifically Northern Virginia. Um, my, my mom is from Jakarta and... Um, you know, immigrated to the States when she was pretty young. My dad is African American, um, born and raised in Washington, DC. So I grew up at the intersection of, of different identities and cultures. Um, and I think right now during, a, the, a peak of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it, it's been a very interesting experience as a Black and Indonesian person that's involved in politics. Um, I studied international relations in, in university, um, and then got involved in electoral politics in, in the U.S. So um, confronting these issues has, has been a part of not only my personal experience and identity, but very much so part of my uh, professional work as well. Um, so thanks for having me on today. Yeah, we're so glad to have you on. Before I went to school in America, and I actually like studied a lot of these issues, it, it's just a lot harder sometimes if you have no understanding to understand what structural racism is. Um, and how deeply unfair American history has been to the black community. It, like, it's just hard maybe for people to understand, like, it's not just racism on, on the street or like what's happening now, but it's like kind of the whole history behind how we're at this point, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that in, in the American context, the, the black identity is 
um, is a very unique experience due to the historical and systematic institutions of slavery, Jim Crow laws, um, and then modern day ramifications of that. And so I think understanding um, within the Indonesian community, like you kind of mentioned earlier, understanding what it's like to be a black person in America can be kind of hard to grapple with. And having to confront these, uh, these notions of anti-blackness, I think that you know, this issue is not black and white, right? And I've been, mm-hmm. over the past couple of weeks, really pushing the broader community, um, I mean, like, in American society, to to look internally into non-black communities of color, so including mm-hmm. Latino and Asian communities, so on and so forth, to that you have to unpack the anti-blackness in those communities of, as well. It's not just a white people mm-hmm. issue, right? Um, and I think for me, you know, being mixed, I have experience some of that anti-blackness in forms of like microaggressions in forms of like passing comments in the forms of quote-unquote jokes that you know older indonesian people will make about you know the color of my skin um and i think it, it it's hard to do that work of like looking internally and realizing that you have some sort of bias and right. prejudice within yourself was that something that you had to like explain to your indonesian relatives at some point and how did that go Yeah, I think that from a historical understanding standpoint, I have encountered a lot of, you know, Indonesian relatives who understand that in the United States, black people Mm -hmm. used to be enslaved. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think there is, it's difficult for, it has been difficult for a lot of them to understand how that manifests in 2020, right? And Mm -hmm. I think prior to the recent murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Maud Arbery, it hasn't been something on it's not top of mind for a lot of my indonesian relatives in the broader community but even after these things it's so for some people it's like a one-off situation or you know it's those Mm -hmm. those black people that you know encounter that or they don't see how it may impact my life um you know depending on how someone perceives me on the street and i think that's the way Mm -hmm. that i've found inroads to explain and make this a real issue Mm -hmm. for a lot of um, people in the Indonesian community is explaining that um, the types of prejudice that I experience Mm -hmm. and how that is a direct um, manifestation of like this historical context, right? It's the stereotypes, it's the way that society at large views black people. um, And it's all, you know, depending Mm -hmm. on the color of your skin. But I also have to, you know, in these conversations, I also preface with the fact that I don't experience racism and anti-blackness the same way that, you know, someone that is um, 100% black does, right? Due to the way mm-hmm. that I look, due to the way that my hair is, like, sometimes people don't even know. I'm so racially ambiguous at times. Um, and so I just, I like to throw that in there to, um, mm-hmm. to contextualize my personal experiences because I understand that there is a lot of privilege that, that, I, that I hold um, from, that, from that point of view. I'm curious, uh, has it been... What what has been the most common questions or the most common talked about angle about Black Lives Matter when you're talking to the Indonesian community? I think right now there there's a especially in in like our generation there are a lot of people who just don't know how to get involved, um, don't know what their personal responsibility is to be a part of this movement. Um, a lot of people aren't politically active on a normal basis. And so I've had yeah. conversations with um, some of my um, Indonesian American friends and like, you know, hour long FaceTime calls about where to start beyond just seeing um, or just posting on social media beyond like reading a book. Like, what can you mm-hmm. tangibly do um, to help move the needle forward? Mm-hmm. And like, you know, if you can't go out and protest, especially right now because of COVID-19, there are a lot of ways to contribute uh, from the comfort of your home. And it, it's really inspiring, honestly, um, to see a lot of my uh, close Indonesian and American friends who weren't, who aren't normally um, involved in, you know, civic life, um, having more inspiration and, and motive to, to get involved.
how was it before? Like, was it just something you, you don't talk about or, or more sparingly? Like, prior to this, how was race talked about, I guess? Or So, from my personal experience, so I'm, um, I'm a hip-hop dancer, and my closest cool. Indonesian-American friends are also hip-hop dancers. Always a conversation about, especially in the States, a lot of mainstream um, hip-hop dance teams and, you know, famous hip-hop dancers are Asian. Right. And mm-hmm. so I think yeah. the conversation about how do you as an Asian American dancer or just an Asian dancer in general across the world um, within the hip hop context, um, what is your responsibility as someone who is partaking in a culture that was founded and cultivated within black communities in the U.S.? Right. And so mm-hmm. I think a lot of the time, you know, the conversation it's kind of surface level. It's about, you know, not using the N word mm-hmm. or it's about, you know, just being socially aware. But I think that that is very, it's a vague idea. Like what does it mean to be socially <laughs> aware, right? Like you can be yeah. socially aware, but you don't actually do anything to support, you know, progressive right. action. So I think prior to, it's like, kind of like that conversation, like we understand that in the US, historically, black people have been marginalized, but like not really understanding how that um, the forms of, of that marginalization, how that exists in 2020, in the 21st century. Yeah. And I think now there is mo- there people are starting to dig deeper rather than just like, you know, recognizing that it's an issue. It's now to the um, the next step, which is how do I get further involved? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are kind of like the historical structural elements of like black history that you've told your friends and they were just like super surprised by like understanding how messed up it is? I think one thing to to mention is the class divides. It's, yeah. it's at the intersection mm-hmm. of race and class. That's an intersection that I think you see a lot of these racist laws coming down on the community. Um, and mm-hmm. that's where you see a lot of people not still today, not being able to access the same sort of resources. Um, and then I think be, beyond the institutional laws that are written um, on paper, you still have a lot of the, the internal racism that people hold. And when you're mm-hmm. talking about people in positions of power, which most of the time they are white people um, who hold these racist views. So it's kind of like you have the, the written law, but you also have the like, uh, unwritten law that's internal and the mm-hmm. coming together are, are why you see the types of racism that you know we experience today um, and that's why you see again I just like to emphasize like mainly poor black people being still marginalized way more than mm-hmm. than other you know communities I think if we asked Amir to like explain all of structural racism today one it would be unfair to <laughs> it would be like Hundreds and like different layers. It is not your burden to <laughs> explain it to us. Uh, Definitely not. But I guess the point is like just to uh, for for our listeners to kind of understand little pieces of the puzzle and realizing this is just one layer of the structural racist foundations of this country. And I think you know I think for a lot of our listeners and even for a lot of people who are reading about Black Lives Matter and sort of all the other things that are bubbling up because of this movement, they realize that. Uh, racism does not exist just in the, in, in the sheer violence that they see in the media, right? Like mm-hmm. racism exists in so many different layers to the point that some people are never aware that they're participating in a racist law, mm-hmm. that they're participating in a racist structure right. because it is so institutionalized. And I think a part of unpacking this whole movement and sort of the tension is trying to open your eyes a little bit, right? To see the many different ways that even this small thing that you think is small that you think is un- inconsequential or is just historical, that has always been this way, is actually racist in its foundation. And how do we confront that and not being afraid to say, just because we've been doing it for hundreds of years doesn't mean it's right. I mean... The other thing to think about in this kind of community is like kind of also the over policing that leads to deaths of black people that we've seen. And that's something people don't understand, right? Like also like poor communities of colors are over policed and like, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just like this other layer um, of issues that is problematic. Um, Yeah. Is it tiring for you sometimes like telling people about this issue? What, 
what can people do? And like, I think like for me, it's like part of how I see my role as an Indonesian person is to like give their resources to my friends and to understand and learn more. But like, what can, you know, what, what besides donating and like learning, what can people do to take action today? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that's important is looking at what things are happening in your particular community um, rather than just the nation at large. I think yeah. your ability to make an impact is much greater when you um, are working directly in your city or your town, mm -hmm. um, in your local area. Um, and I think beyond that, it's like, to your question about is it exhausting? Yeah, it is. Um, but it's um, it's nothing new. That's that's one interesting thing is um, having these conversations um, become more mainstream with non-Black people and and uh, hearing them saying how exhausting it has been. And it's like, yeah, dude, like <laughs> now you you kind of understand. A little Welcome more, to the party. A little more about what it feels like going living your life exactly. um, as as a Black person. Um, yeah. And I think there are a lot of things that kind of go overlooked. It's not just the larger um, structural issues. It's like the day-to-day -day experience, for example, of having more anxiety and fear just like go out into the world as a black yeah. person. Um, that, that takes a toll on, on your mental health. That takes a toll on just your like, general well-being. And those are like the little personal yeah. um, experiences that I think weigh you down. And like... Mm -hmm. This idea of microaggressions, yes, like that one microaggression um, may have not been that detrimental, but when you have, when you experience a microaggression every day, mm -hmm. uh, it, it starts to just tear you down even more. Um, but I will say that it's been inspiring to see um, kind of these organizations and grassroots action um, become a, a thing that, that's happening more. Mm -hmm. um, and and people have this thirst to get involved, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and that includes like seeing a lot of black friends, a lot of Indonesian friends, a lot of white friends, um, just, you know, rolling up our sleeves and, and doing the work. And, and it, it's really that part to me, despite all of the atrocities, has been very uplifting. It's like, oh, like people actually care now after like yeah, so many yeah. years. It's like kind of like that's refreshing. <laughs> for once and i think you know it's 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 definitely also part of our responsibilities right to continue the conversation beyond just because of the, this particular episode like that is it's like heinous and tragic that it takes the murdering of people's lives in order for people to make this into a conversation when in fact as you've said these kind of conversations have been happening in black communities all their lives we need to keep up the conversation as well right like i think that's really important, even as uncomfortable as it might be for some people. I think that's really important to to be uncomfortable. Right. And it's like for me, I feel like I don't have the right to say I'm like exhausted or like yeah. I'm tired. It's like just because that's not my role as an ally. It's like to like as much as possible to be helpful and not to like center the issue on me and my feelings. If that makes sense, um, I think it's like. For the rest of the people who are not in the black community, I feel like the work is just starting now. And that's, I think, how it should be perceived. Um, like, what can we talk about microaggressions? And I think people don't understand sometimes microaggressions and how damaging it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think like an example that I've experienced in the Indonesian community is, uh, uh, for example, in the summertime, my skin gets darker, right? Mm -hmm. And happens to a lot of people because it's hands, it's tanning, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, because of my ethnic makeup, my skin gets dark, a lot darker than a lot of Indonesian people um, because I'm mm -hmm. black. So, you know, during those summer months, um, you know, having a relative or a family friend make a passing comment about, oh, you've been in the sun too much, your skin is getting darker, stay inside more because you don't want your skin uh -huh. to get darker, right? Wow, yeah. I think that's an example of a microaggression because you are, this person is uh, associating my darker skin with something that is less desirable, something yeah. that is not as good as when my skin is lighter. And I think within the Indonesian community, it's important to challenge the people who, who say that in the moment, right? And yeah. older relative. And I think in Indonesian culture, it can be really hard, um, especially when you're talking to a parent, a grandparent, to push back. 
um, at what they say because of that, uh, the idea of respecting your elders and, you know, this generational gap. Yeah. Um, but it's so important in that moment to tell that person that it's not okay to say that, you know, or yeah. if you're the person experiencing it, tell them that doesn't, you know, make me feel good. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Um, and those conversations are hard. But I think those are the types of conversations that need to happen within the Indonesian community. Uh, if they don't happen, uh, these types of um, microaggressions just keep happening and people don't understand that it's an issue. Yeah. No one has ever called them out on it or has opened up the dialogue um, to explain why that's not okay to say. Right. Um, and, you know, I think there are different forms of that and, or, you know, there are all these, for example, all these statistics about black people. Um, for example, the media network for a white family in America is $171,000 compared to the median net worth of a black family, which is $17,600. That's a huge disparity. Mm -hmm. And I think that for people who don't really understand and don't know how to contextualize that statistic, it's easy to say, oh, you know, black people aren't as hardworking or black people are, you know, quote unquote, not as good. I mean, look at the numbers, right? Yeah. And I think like that, you need to open up the discussion and then contextualize it for that person, explain these structural laws and institutions mm -hmm. that have made that a reality, right? It's not because black people are innately less than it's because black people in the U S have experienced all these obstacles and barriers right. um, that have prevented them from um, accumulating wealth in the same way that white families have been able to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to, you know, pointing out those two, two different types of examples to say, like, I think the first step in, in, in the Asian community is just like opening up the conversation, which I think, 99% of the time is going to require, you know, people in our generation challenging the words and comments of older generations, which again, I completely understand it is so hard to do that. Um, so important. And I think that's the only way that, that we are able to move forward productively. I feel like for a lot of the older generation, um, the way they've perceived black people and black culture is so shaped by the media they've consumed. Mm -hmm. And media is definitely not equitable. It has its own racist biases and prejudices. And, and I still remember when, when, you know, having friends growing up here and then my parents would just ask like, oh, what, you know, what ethnicity are they? And, you know, like much more blunt way and I'm not going to repeat it here and I'm just like why does that matter right like what why why do you think we can only be friends with people who look like us why do you think we should only uh, give attention and love and care to people who look like us aren't we all the same human species approaching that topic with your parents especially at least from my personal experience is so hard just trying to make them see how unquestionably racist their views are uh, yeah. <laughs> but they don't realize it right? for a lot of the older generation at least from my experience they don't think of any other possibility because that's how that's how they've been raised. That's how they've grown up. And I think part of the conversation here is also racism is definitely also generational, yeah. right? Like you there's can, different shades of racism. Young people can also be racist. We have racist friends. This week, oh no, yeah. no. I, I guess what I mean by generational is that it can be passed on to your, your children, like your your family members, right? It, those ideas that you never thought that you have. Uh, because, you know, you might be thinking like, oh, I'm not, I'm not like actively racist or anything like that. But if your parents are sort of like educating you and raising you in an environment that is condoning that kind of behavior. Right. Right. I think there is something to say about like not being racist and like just just because you're not racist doesn't mean you're also anti-racist and like kind of like trying to move that. It's not enough to just be not racist these days. You have to be anti-racist, right? You have to be anti-racism. Like uh, it's not just... Oh, I'm I'm not a racist, so I'm fine. The people around you and the people who you can influence and you can change might be espousing racist views that they might not know of, and you have to be anti-racist and fight those views, right? Otherwise, we're not going to move anywhere. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's a super important uh, a point that we need to also focus on um, in terms of like what you can do, right? And I example of calling out, you know, friends and peers or older, you know, relatives or family friends. Um, in that example, the not 
racist action would be just to not repeat the, that what they said, exactly. not say that. Yeah, but totally. we take anti-racist action. It requires you to call that person out to mm-hmm. explain and educate them as to why that's not okay totally. um, and not acceptable. Um, and so that framework is something that more people need to uh, incorporate into how they take action, right? Um, I think to your point about representation, especially in the media or just in civic life in general, it, it's, it's crucial um, not only to have quote unquote positive representations of black people for non-black people to see and understand mm-hmm. that, you know, black people are, are also diverse within the community. There are many <laughs> types of uh, black yeah. people because we're human, but it's also for young black kids to see these representations uh, so that they understand that I can do these things um, as well. I yeah. can aspire to um, be quote unquote successful um, and having examples of different sectors and domains of life um, can completely alter the the trajectory of, of a young black kid um, growing up that they're less than because of something they can't change about themselves, right? Um, and, and, and tying that into, you know, what we can do as someone who's involved in politics, it's really important to have lawmakers who understand the experience of being yeah. marginalized due to the color of your skin right. um, so that, you know, we're not a, a, a not racist society, that we're truly implementing laws that are anti-racist, that are... Yeah. Um, doing the the wrongs that we have structurally enforced in society um and i think one thing is like of course electing black officials but also electing non-black officials who are supporting the cause and who are supporting the lives of black communities and right now in the presidential cycle everyone is focused on who's going to be in the white house getting trump out of office don't get me wrong, that's so important. It's crucial to shape the next few decades of, of our society. However, um, a lot of the times, many of these issues take place at the local um, level. Yeah. So focusing on down ballot elected officials is just as important, and in some cases, even more important mm-hmm. um, in terms of fixing these very racist and corrupt that we have going on. One example is a lot of you know police chiefs, uh, um, the budget for police department, um, a lot of the time is dictated by mayors. Mm-hmm. How many people focus on their mayor- mayoral race? Not a lot of people, because it's not, you know, it's not an ex- as exciting as, you know, trying to get someone in the White House. But we need to focus yeah. on mayors, on governors, on our members of Congress, on school boards, right. city councils, um, district attorneys. There are all these people who make very important issues for our communities. Um, yet the community at large doesn't focus enough on who's in those in those seats. That's the end of part one of our conversation with Amir Jones. Part two will come out next week. So we hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find more information and resources of whatever we talked about on our website, dialica.id. Music credits to John Dealey, Lee Rosevere, and of course, Broke for Free. If you like what you hear and want to support us, please review our podcast on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. And please share our podcast with your friends. It's the best way to spread the word about Dialogica. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or just shoot us a message on our Facebook page. You can also find us on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and our Twitter. Please follow us in these various platforms. Our Twitter handle is at dialogicapod. Also, follow me on Twitter. It's Steph Tank. That's S-T-E-P-H-T-A-N-G-K. Thank you again and see you guys next time. Bye!